Milton, by William Blake, Section One. Milton, a poem in two books. The author and printer William Blake, eighteen o four. To justify the ways of God to men. Written and etched, eighteen o four to eighteen o eight. Preface. The stolen and perverted writings of Homer and Ovid, of Plato and Cicero, which all men ought to condemn, are set up by artifice against the sublime of the Bible. But when the new age is at leisure to pronounce, all will be set right, and those grand works of the more ancient, unconsciously and professedly inspired men, will hold their proper rank, and the daughters of memory shall become the daughters of inspiration. Shakespeare and Milton were both curbed by the general malady and infection from the silly Greek and Latin slaves of the sword. Rouse up, O young men of the new age! Set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings, for we have hirelings in the camp, the court, and the university, who would, if they could, for ever depress mental and prolong corporeal war. Painters, on you I call, sculptors, architects. Suffer not the fashionable fools to depress your powers by the prices they pretend to give for contemptible works, or the expensive advertising boasts that they make of such works. Believe Christ and His apostles that there is a class of men whose whole delight is in destroying. We do not want either Greek or Roman models, if we are but just and true to our own imaginations. Those worlds of eternity, in which we shall live for ever in Jesus our Lord. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my spear. O clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall the sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem, in England's green and pleasant land. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Numbers, eleventh chapter, twenty ninth verse. Milton. Book the first. Daughters of Beulah, muses who inspire the poet's song, record the journey of immortal Milton through your realms of terror and mild moony lustre, in soft sexual delusions of varied beauty, to delight the wanderer and repose his burning thirst and freezing hunger. Come into my hand by your mild power, descending down the nerves of my right arm from out the portals of my brain, whereby your ministry. The eternal great humanity divine planted his paradise, and in it caused the spectres of the dead to take sweet forms in likeness of himself. Tell also of the false tongue, vegetated beneath your land of shadows, of its sacrifices and its offerings, even till Jesus, the image of the invisible God, became its prey, a curse, an offering, and an atonement for death eternal, in the heavens of Albion. And before the gates of Jerusalem, his emanation, and the heavens beneath Beulah. Say first, what moved Milton, who walked about in eternity one hundred years, pondering the intricate mazes of providence, unhappy though in heaven. He obeyed. He murmured not. He was silent, viewing his sixfold emanation scattered through the deep in torment. To go into the deep, her to redeem, and himself to perish. What cause at length moved Milton to this unexampled deed? A bard's prophetic song. For sitting at eternal tables, terrific among the sons of Albion, in chorus solemn and loud, a bard broke forth. All sat attentive to the awful man. Mark well my words; they are of your eternal salvation. Three classes are created by the hammer of Los and woven by Enitharmon's looms. When Albion was slain upon his mountains and in his tent, through envy of living form, even of the divine vision, 
and of the sports of wisdom in the human imagination, which is the divine body of the Lord Jesus, blessed for ever. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. You rise and lay in darkness and solitude, in chains of the mind locked up. Los seized his hammer and tongs. He laboured at his resolute anvil, among indefinite druid rocks and snows of doubt and reasoning. Refusing all definite form, the abstract horror roofed, stony hard, and a first age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Down sunk with fright, a red round globe, hot burning, deep, deep down into the abyss, panting, conglobing, trembling, and a second age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Rolling round into two little orbs, and closed in two little caves, the eyes beheld the abyss, lest bones of solidness freeze it over, and a third age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. From beneath his orbs of vision, two ears in close volutions shot spiring out in the deep darkness, and petrified as they grew, and a fourth age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Hanging upon the wind, two nostrils bent down into the deep, and a fifth age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. In ghastly torment sick, a tongue of hunger and thirst flamed out, and a sixth age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Enraged and stifled without and within, in terror and woe, he threw his right arm to the north, his left arm to the south, and his feet stamped the nether abyss, in trembling and howling and dismay, and a seventh age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Terrified, Lo stood in the abyss, and his immortal limbs grew deadly pale. He became what he beheld, for a red round globe sunk down from his bosom into the deep. In pangs he hovered over it, trembling and weeping. Suspended it shook the nether abyss. In tremblings he wept over it, he cherished it in deadly sickening pain, till separated into a female pale, as the cloud that brings the snow. All the while from his back a blue fluid exuded in sinews, hardening in the abyss, till separated into a male form, howling in jealousy. Within labouring, beholding without, from particulars to generals, subduing his spectre, they builded the looms of generation. They builded great Golganusa, times on times, ages on ages. First Orc was born, then the shadowy female, then all Los's family. At last an Athamon brought forth Satan, refusing form in vain, the miller of eternity made subservient to the great harvest that he may go to his own place, prince of the starry wheels, beneath the plough of Runtra and the harrow of the Almighty in the hands of Palamabron, where the starry mills of Satan are built beneath the earth and waters of the mundane shell. Here the three classes of men take their sexual texture, woven. The sexual is threefold, the human is fourfold. If you account it wisdom, when you are angry, to be silent, and not to show it, I do not account that wisdom but folly. Every man's wisdom is peculiar to his own individuality. O Satan, my youngest born, art thou not prince of the starry hosts, and of the wheels of heaven, to turn the mills day and night? Art thou not Newton's pantocrator, weaving the woof of Locke? To mortals thy mills seem everything, and the harrow of Shaddai, a scheme of human conduct invisible and incomprehensible. Get to thy labours at the mills, and leave me to my wrath. Satan was going to reply, but Los rolled his loud thunders. Anger me not, thou canst not drive the harrow in pity's path. Thy work is eternal death, with mills and ovens and cauldrons. Trouble me no more, thou canst not have eternal life. So Los spoke. Satan trembling obeyed, weeping along the way. Mark well my words, they were of your eternal salvation. Between South Moulton Street and Stratford Place, Calvary's foot, where the victims were preparing for sacrifice their cherubim. Around their loins poured forth their arrows, and the bosoms beamed with all colours of precious stones, and their inmost palaces resounded with preparation of animals wild and tame. Mark well my words, 
Corporeal friends are spiritual enemies. Mocking druidical mathematical proportion of length, breadth, height. Displaying naked beauty, with flute and harp and song. Palamabron with the fiery harrow in morning returning from breathing fields. Satan fainted beneath the artillery. Christ took on sin and the virgin's womb and put it off on the cross. All pitied the piteous and was wrath with the wrathful, and Los heard it. And this is the manner of the daughters of Albion in their beauty. Every one is threefold in head and heart and reins, and every one has three gates into the three heavens of Beulah, which shine translucent in their foreheads, and their bosoms, and their loins, surrounded with fires unapproachable. But whom they please they take up into their heavens in intoxicating delight. For the elect cannot be redeemed, but created continually by offering and atonement in the cruelties of moral law. Hence the three classes of men take their fixed destinations. They are the two countries and the reasoning negative. While the females prepare the victims, the males at furnaces and anvils dance the dance of tears and pain. Loud lightnings lash on their limbs as they turn the whirlwinds loose upon the furnaces, lamenting around the anvils, and this their song. Ah, weak and wide astray, ah, shut and narrow doleful form, creeping in reptile flesh upon the bosom of the ground. The eye of man is a little narrow orb, closed up and dark, scarcely beholding the great light, conversing with the void. The ear a little shell, in small volutions shutting out all melodies and comprehending only discord and harmony. The tongue a little moisture fills, a little food it cloys, a little sound it utters, and its cries are faintly heard. Then brings forth moral virtue, the cruel virgin Babylon. Can such an eye judge of the stars, and looking through its tubes measure the sunny rays that point their spears on Eudenaden? Can such an ear, filled with the vapours of the yawning pit, judge of the pure melodious harp struck by a hand divine? Can such closed nostrils feel a joy, or tale of autumn fruits, when grapes and figs burst their covering to the joyful air? Can such a tongue boast of the living waters, or take in aught but the vegetable ratio, and load the faint delight? Can such gross lips perceive? Alas, folded within themselves, they touch not aught, but pallid turn and tremble at every wind. Thus they sing, creating the three classes among druid rocks. Charles calls on Milton for atonement. Cromwell is ready. James calls for fires in Golganusa, for heaps of smoking ruins in the night of prosperity and wantonness, which he himself created among the daughters of Albion, among the rocks of the druids, when Satan fainted beneath the arrows of Elenitria, and mathematic proportion was subdued by living proportion. From Golganusa, the spiritual fourfold London Eternal, in immense labours and sorrows, ever building, ever falling, through Albion's four forests, which overspread all the earth, from London Stone to Blackheath East, to Hounslow West, to Finchley North, to Norwood South, and the weights of Enetharmon's loom play lulling cadences on the winds of Albion, from Caithness in the north to Lizard Point and Dover in the south. Loud sounds the hammer of Los, and loud his bellows is heard, before London to Hampstead's breadths and Highgate's heights, to Stratford and Old Bow, and across to the gardens of Kensington, on Tyburn's brook. Loud groans Thames beneath the iron forge of Rintra and Palamabron, of Theatom and Bromian, to forge the instruments of harvest, the plough and harrow to pass over the nations. The Surrey hills glow like the clinkers of the furnace, Lambeth's vale, where Jerusalem's foundations began, where they were laid in ruins, where they were laid in ruins from every nation, and oak groves rooted, dark gleams before the furnace mouth, a heap of burning ashes. When shall Jerusalem return and overspread all the nations? Return, Return to Lambeth's vale, O building of human souls. Thence stony druid temples overspread the island white, and thence from Jerusalem's ruins, from her walls of salvation and praise, through the whole earth were reared from Ireland to Mexico and Peru west, and east to China and Japan, 
till Babel, the spectre of Albion, frowned over the nations in glory and war. All things begin and end in Albion's ancient druid rocky shore. But now the starry heavens are fled from the mighty limbs of Albion. Loud sounds the hammer of Los, loud turn the wheels of Enetharmon. Her looms vibrate with soft affections, weaving the web of life out from the ashes of the dead. Los lifts his iron ladles with molten ore. He heaves the iron cliffs in his rattling chains. From Hyde Park to the almshouses of Mile End and Old Bow. Here the three classes of mortal men take their fixed destinations, and hence they overspread the nations of the whole earth, and hence the web of life is woven and the tender sinews of life created, and the three classes of men regulated by Los's hammers and woven by Inithamon's looms and spun beneath the spindle of Tirza. The first, the elect from before the foundation of the world, the second, the redeemed, the third, the reprobate, and formed to destruction from the mother's womb. The reprobate are the first, who follow with me my plough. Of the first class was Satan. With incomparable mildness, his primitive tyrannical attempts on Los. With most endearing love, he soft entreated Los to give to him Palamabron's station. For Palamabron returned with labour wearied every evening. Palamabron oft refused, and as often Satan offered his service till by repeated offers and repeated entreaties, Los gave to him the harrow of the Almighty. Alas, blamable, Palamabron feared to be angry, lest Satan should accuse him of ingratitude, and Los believed the accusation through Satan's extreme mildness. Satan laboured all day. It was a thousand years. In the evening returning terrified, over-laboured and astonished, embraced soft with a brother's tears, Palamabron, who also wept. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Next morning Palamabron rose. The horses of the harrow were maddened with tormenting fury, and the servants of the harrow, the gnomes, accused Satan with indignation, fury and fire. Then Palamabron, reddening like the moon in an eclipse, spoke, saying, You know Satan's mildness and his self-imposition, Seeming a brother, being a tyrant, even thinking himself a brother, while he is murdering the just. Prophetic I behold his future course through darkness and despair to eternal death. But we must not be tyrants also. He hath assumed my place for one whole day, under pretense of pity and love to me. My horses hath he maddened, and my fellow servants injured. How should he, he, know the duties of another? O oh, foolish forbearance! Would I had towed Los all my heart. But patience, O oh my friends, all may be well. Silent remain while I call Los and Satan. Loud as the wind of Beulah that unroots the rocks and hills, Palamabron called, and Los and Satan came before him, and Palamabron showed the horses and the servants. Satan wept, and mildly cursing Palamabron, him accused of crimes himself had wrought. Los trembled. Satan's blandishments almost persuaded the prophet of eternity that Palamabron was Satan's enemy, and that the gnomes, being Palamabron's friends, were leagued together against Satan through ancient enmity. What could Los do? How could he judge, when Satan's self believed that he had not oppressed the horses of the harrow, nor the servants? So Los said, Henceforth, Palamabron, let each his own station keep, nor in pity false, nor in officious brotherhood, where none needs, be active. Meantime Palamabron's horses raged with thick flames redundant, and the harrow maddened with fury. Trembling Palamabron stood, the strongest of demons trembled, curbing his living creatures. Many of the strongest gnomes they bit in their wild fury, who also maddened like wildest beasts. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. End of section one. Milton by William Blake. Section two. Meanwhile wept Satan before Los, accusing Palamabron, himself exculpating with mildest speech, for himself believed that he had not oppressed nor injured the refractory servants. 
But Satan returning to his mills, for Palamabron had served the mills of Satan as the easier task, found all confusion, and back returned to Los, not filled with vengeance but with tears, himself convinced of Palamabron's turpitude. Los beheld the servants of the mills drunken with wine, and dancing wild with shouts and Palamabron's songs, rending the forests green with echoing confusion, though the sun was risen on high. Then Los took off his left sandal, placing it on his head, signal of solemn mourning. When the servants of the mills beheld the signal, they in silence stood, though drunk with wine. Los wept. But Rintra also came, and Denethamon on his arm leaned tremblingly, observing all these things. And Los said, Ye genii of the mills, the sun is on high, your labours call you, Palamabron is also in sad dilemma. His horses are mad, his harrow confounded, his companions enraged. Mine is the fault. I should have remembered that pity divides the soul, and man unmans. Follow with me my plough. This mournful day must be a blank in nature. Follow with me, and tomorrow again resume your labours, and this day shall be a mournful day. Wildly they followed Los and Rintra, and the mills were silent. They mourned all day this mournful day of Satan and Palamabron, and all the elect and all the redeemed mourned one toward another, upon the mountains of Albion, among the cliffs of the dead. They ploughed in tears. Incessant poured Jehovah's rain, and Molech's thick fires contending with the rain thundered above, rolling terrible over their heads. Satan wept over Palamabron. Theotormon and Bromion contended on the side of Satan, pitying his youth and beauty trembling at eternal death. Michael contended against Satan in the rolling thunder. Thulo, the friend of Satan, also reproved him, faint their reproof. But Rintra, who was of the reprobate, of those formed to destruction, in indignation for Satan's soft dissimulation of friendship, flamed above all the ploughed furrows, angry, red, and furious, till Michael sat down in the furrow, weary, dissolved in tears. Satan, who drave the team beside him, stood angry and red. He smote Thulo and slew him, and he stood terrible over Michael, urging him to arise. He wept, and Athamon saw his tears, but Los hid Thulo from her sight, lest she should die of grief. She wept, she trembled, she kissed Satan, she wept over Michael. She formed a space for Satan and Michael, and for the poor infected. Trembling, she wept over the space, and closed it with a tender moon. Low secret buried Thulo, weeping disconsolate over the moony space. But Palamabron called down a great solemn assembly, that he who will not defend truth may be compelled to defend a lie, that he may be snared and caught and taken. And all Eden descended into Palamabron's tent, among Albion's druids and bards, in the caves beneath Albion's death couch, in the caverns of death, in the corner of the Atlantic, and in the midst of the great assembly, Palamabron prayed, O God, protect me from my friends, that they have not power over me. Thou hast given me power to protect myself from my bitterest enemies. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Then rose the two witnesses, Rintra and Palamabron, and Palamabron appealed to all Eden, and received judgment, and lo, it fell on Rintra and his rage, which now flamed high and furious in Satan against Palamabron, till it became a proverb in Eden, Satan is among the reprobate. Los in his wrath cursed heaven and earth. He rent up nations. Standing on Albion's rocks, among high-reared druid temples, which reached the stars of heaven and stretched from pole to pole, he displaced continents. The oceans fled before his face. He altered the poles of the world, east, west, and north, and south. But he closed up Enatharmon from the sight of all these things. For Satan, flaming with Rintra's fury, hidden beneath his own mildness, accused Palamabron before the assembly of ingratitude, of malice. He created seven deadly sins, drawing out his infernal scroll of moral laws and cruel punishments upon the clouds of Jehovah, to pervert the divine voice in its entrance to the earth, with thunder of war and trumpets sound, with armies of disease, punishments and deaths mustered and numbered, saying, I am God alone. 
There is no other. Let all obey my principles of moral individuality. I have brought them from the uppermost, innermost recesses of my eternal mind. Transgressors I will rend off for ever, as now I rend this accursed family from my covering. Thus Satan raged amidst the assembly, and his bosom grew opaque against the divine vision. The paved terraces of his bosom inward shone with fires, but the stones becoming opaque hid him from sight in an extreme blackness and darkness. And there a world of deeper Uro was opened in the midst of the assembly, in Satan's bosom a vast unfathomable abyss. Astonishment held the assembly in an awful silence, and tears fell down as dews of night, and a loud solemn universal groan was uttered from the east and from the west and from the south and from the north, and Satan stood opaque, immeasurable, covering the east with solid blackness round his hidden heart, with thunders uttered from his hidden wheels, accusing loud the divine mercy for protecting Palamabron in his tent. Rintra reared up walls of rocks and poured rivers and moats of fire round the walls. Columns of fire guard around between Satan and Palamabron in the terrible darkness. And Satan, not having the science of wrath, but only of pity, rent them asunder, and wrath was left to wrath, and pity to pity. He sunk down, a dreadful death unlike the slumbers of Beulah. The separation was terrible. The dead was reposed on his couch, beneath the couch of Albion, on the seven mountains of Rome, and the whole place of the covering cherub, Rome, Babylon, and Tyre. His spectre raging furious descended into its space. Then Los and Enathamon knew that Satan is Urizen, drawn down by Orc and the shadowy female into generation. Oft Enathamon entered weeping into the space, there appearing an aged woman, raving along the streets. The space is named Canaan. Then she returned to Los, weary, frighted as from dreams. The nature of a female space is this. It shrinks the organs of life till they become finite and itself seems infinite. And Satan vibrated in the immensity of the space, limited to those without, but infinite to those within. It fell down and became Canaan, closing Los from eternity in Albion's cliffs, a mighty fiend against the divine humanity, mustering to war. Satan, ah me, is gone to his own place, said Los. Their god I will not worship in their churches, nor king in their theatres. Elenitria, whence is this jealousy running along the mountains? British women were not jealous when Greek and Roman were jealous. Everything in eternity shines by its own internal light, but thou darkenest every internal light with the arrows of thy quiver, bound up in the horns of jealousy to a deadly fading moon, and Ocalathron binds the sun into a jealous globe, that everything is fixed opaque, without internal light. Solos lamented over Satan, who triumphant divided the nations. He set his face against Jerusalem, to destroy the Eon of Albion. But Los hid Anathamon from the sight of all these things upon the Thames, whose lulling harmony reposed her soul, where Beulah lovely terminates in rocky Albion, terminating in Hyde Park, on Tyburn's awful brook, and the mills of Satan were separated into a moony space among the rocks of Albion's temples, and Satan's druid sons offer the human victims throughout all the earth, and Albion's dread tomb, immortal on his rock, overshadowed the whole earth, where Satan, making to himself laws from his own identity, compelled others to serve him in moral gratitude and submission, being called God, setting himself above all that is called God, and all the spectres of the dead calling themselves sons of God in his synagogues, worship Satan under the unutterable name. And it was inquired why, in a great solemn assembly, the innocent should be condemned for the guilty. Then an eternal rose, saying, If the guilty should be condemned, he must be an eternal death, and one must die for another throughout all eternity. Satan has fallen from his station, and never can be redeemed, but must be new created continually, moment by moment. And therefore the class of Satan shall be called the elect, and those of Rintra the reprobate, and those of Palamabron the redeemed. For he is redeemed from Satan's law, the wrath falling on Rintra. And therefore Palamabron dared not to call a solemn assembly, till Satan had assumed Rintra's wrath in the day of mourning, in a feminine delusion of false pride self-deceived. So spake the Eternal, and confirmed it with a thunderous oath. But when Luetha, 
a daughter of Beulah, beheld Satan's condemnation, she down descended into the midst of the great solemn assembly, offering herself a ransom for Satan, taking on her his sin. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. And Luetha stood glowing with varying colours, immortal, heart-piercing and lovely, and her moth-like elegance shone over the assembly. At length, standing upon the golden floor of Palamabron, she spake, I am the author of this sin. By my suggestion, my parent pa, Satan, has committed this transgression. I loved Palamabron, and I sought to approach his tent. But beautiful Elenitria, with her silver arrows, repelled me, for her light is terrible to me. I fade before her immortal beauty. Or wherefore doth a dragon form forth issue from my limbs, to seize her newborn son? Ah, me! The wretched Luetha. This to prevent. Entering the doors of Satan's brain, night after night, like sweet perfumes, I stupefied the masculine perceptions, and kept only the feminine awake. Hence rose his soft, delusory love to Palamabron. Admiration joined with envy. Cupidity unconquerable. My fault, when at noon of day, the horses of Palamabron called for rest and pleasant death. I sprang out of the breast of Satan, over the harrow, beaming in all my beauty, that I might unloose the flaming steeds, as Elenitria used to do. But too well those living creatures knew that I was not Elenitria, and they break the traces. But me the servants of the harrow saw not but as a bow of varying colours on the hills, terribly raged the horses. Satan astonished, and with power above his control, compelled the gnomes to curb the horses and to throw banks of sand around the fiery flaming harrow in labyrinthine forms, and brooks between to intersect the meadows in their course. The harrow cast thick flames. Jehovah thundered above. Chaos and ancient night fled from beneath the fiery harrow. The harrow cast thick flames, and orbed us round in concave fires, a hell of our own making. See, its flames still gird me round. Jehovah thundered above. Satan in pride of heart drove the fierce harrow among the constellations of Jehovah, drawing a third part in the fires a stubble north and south, to devour Albion and Jerusalem, the emanation of Albion, driving the harrow in pity's paths. T'was then, with our dark fires which now gird round us, O oh, eternal torment, I formed the serpent of precious stones and gold, turned poisons on the sultry wastes. The gnomes in all that day spared not, they cursed Satan bitterly, to do unkind things in kindness, with power armed to say the most irritating things in the midst of tears and love. These are the stings of the serpent. Thus did we by them, till thus they in return retaliated, and the living creatures maddened. The gnomes laboured, I weeping hid in Satan's inmost brain. But when the gnomes refused to labour more, with blandishments I came forth from the head of Satan. Back the gnomes recoiled, and called me sin, and for a sign portentous held me. Soon day sunk, and Palamabron returned. Trembling I hid myself in Satan's inmost palace, of his nervous fine-wrought brain. For Elenitria met Satan, with all her singing woman, terrific in their joy, and pouring wine of wildest power. They gave Satan their wine. Indignant at the burning wrath, wild with prophetic fury, his former life became like a dream. Clothed in the serpent's folds, in selfish holiness demanding purity, being most impure, self-condemned to eternal tears, he drove me from his inmost brain, and the doors closed with thunder's sound. O divine vision, who didst create the female to repose the sleepers of Beulah, pity the repentant Luetha. My sick couch bears the dark shades of eternal death, enfolding the spectre of Satan. He furious refuses to repose and sleep. I humbly bow in all my sin before the throne divine, not so the sick one. Alas, 
what shall be done him to restore, who calls the individual law holy, and despises the Saviour, glorying to involve Albion's body in fires of eternal war? Now Leotha ceased. Tears flowed, but the divine pity supported her. All is my fault. We are the spectre of Luva, the murderer of Albion. O valour, O Luva, O Albion, O lovely Jerusalem. The sin was begun in eternity, and will not rest to eternity, till two eternities meet together. Ah, lost, lost, lost for ever. So Leotha spoke. But when she saw that Enathamon had created a new space to protect Satan from punishment, she fled to Enathamon's tent, and hid herself. Loud raging thundered the assembly dark and clouded, and they ratified the kind decision of Enathamon, and gave a time to the space, even six thousand years, and sent Lucifer for its guard. But Lucifer refused to die, and in pride he forsook his charge, and they elected Molech. And when Molech was impatient, the divine hand found the two limits, first of opacity, then of contraction. Opacity was named Satan, contraction was named Adam. Triple Elohim came, Elohim wearied, fainted. They elected Shaddai. Shaddai angry, Pehad descended. Pehad terrified, they sent Jehovah, and Jehovah was leprous. Loud he called, stretching his hand to eternity. For then the body of death was perfected in hypocritic holiness, around the Lamb, a female tabernacle woven in Cathedron's looms. He died as a reprobate, he was punished as a transgressor. Glory, 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 to the Holy Lamb of God. I touch the heavens as an instrument to glorify the Lord. The elect shall meet the redeemed on Albion's rocks. They shall meet astonished at the transgressor, in him beholding the Saviour, and the elect shall say to the redeemed, We behold, it is of divine mercy alone, of free gift and election that we live. Our virtues and cruel goodnesses have deserved eternal death. Thus they weep upon the fatal brook of Albion's river. But Elenitria met Luetha in the place where she was hidden, and threw aside her arrows and laid down her sounding bow. She soothed her with soft words and brought her to Palamabron's bed, in moments new created for delusion, interwoven round about. In dreams she bore the shadowy spectre of sleep, and named him Death. In dreams she bore Rahab, the mother of Tirza, and her sisters in Lambeth's Vales, in Cambridge and in Oxford, places of thought, intricate labyrinths of times and spaces unknown, that Loetha lived in Palamabron's tent, and Uthun was her charming guard. The bard ceased. All considered, and a loud resounding murmur continued round the halls. And much they questioned the immortal loud-voiced bard, and many condemned the high-toned song, saying, Pity and love are too venerable for the imputation of guilt. Others said, If it is true, if the acts have been performed, let the bard himself witness. Where hadst thou this terrible song? The bard replied, I am inspired. I know it is truth, for I sing according to the inspiration of the poetic genius, who is the eternal, all-protecting divine humanity, to whom be glory and power and dominion evermore. Amen. End of section 2 Milton by William Blake Section 3 Then there was murmuring in the heavens of Albion, concerning generation and the vegetative power, and concerning the Lamb the Saviour. Albion trembled to Italy, Greece and Egypt, to Tartary and Hindustan and China, and to Great America, shaking the roots and fast foundations of the earth in doubtfulness. The loud-voiced bard, terrified, took refuge in Milton's bosom. Then Milton rose up from the heavens of Albion, ardorous. The whole assembly wept prophetic, seeing in Milton's face, and in his lineaments divine, the shades of death and Ulro. He took off the robe of the promise, and ungirded himself from the oath of God. And Milton said, I go to eternal death. The nations still follow after the detestable gods of Priam, in pomp of warlike selfhood, contradicting and blaspheming. 
When will the resurrection come to deliver the sleeping body from corruptibility? O when, Lord Jesus, wilt thou come? Tarry no longer, for my soul lies at the gates of death. I will arise and look forth for the morning of the grave. I will go down to the sepulchre to see if morning breaks. I will go down to self-annihilation and eternal death, lest the last judgment come and find me unannihilate, and I be seized and given into the hands of my own selfhood. The Lamb of God is seen through mists and shadows, hovering over the sepulchres in clouds of Jehovah and winds of Elohim, a disk of blood distant, and heavens and earths roll dark between. What do I hear before the judgment, without my emanation, with the daughters of memory, and not with the daughters of inspiration? I and myself who am that Satan, I am that evil one. He is my spectre. In my obedience to loose him from my hells, to claim the hells, my furnaces, I go to eternal death. And Milton said, I go to eternal death. Eternity shuddered, for he took the outside course among the graves of the dead, a mournful shade. Eternity shuddered at the image of eternal death. Then on the verge of Beulah he beheld his own shadow, a mournful form double, hermaphroditic, male and female, in one wonderful body. And he entered into it in direful pain, for the dread shadow twenty-sevenfold reached to the depths of direst hell, and thence to Albion's land, which is the earth of vegetation on which now I write. The seven angels of the presence wept over Milton's shadow. As when a man dreams, he reflects not that his body sleeps, else he would wake. So seemed he entering his shadow. But with him the spirits of the seven angels of the presence entering, they gave him still perceptions of his sleeping body, which now arose and walked with them in Eden, as an eighth image divine, though darkened, and though walking as one walks in sleep and the seven comforted and supported him. Like as a polypus that vegetates beneath the deep, they saw his shadow vegetated underneath the couch of death. For when he entered into his shadow, himself, his real and immortal self, was, as appeared to those who dwell in immortality, as one sleeping on a couch of gold, and those in immortality gave forth their emanations like females of sweet beauty to guard round him and to feed his lips with food of Eden, in his cold and dim repose. But to himself he seemed a wanderer, lost in dreary night. Onwards his shadow kept its course among the spectres called Satan. But swift as lightning passing them, startled the shades of hell, beheld him in a trail of light, as of a comet that travels into chaos. So Milton went guarded within. The nature of infinity is this that everything has its own vortex. And when once a traveller through eternity has passed that vortex, he perceives it roll backward behind his path, into a globe itself enfolding like a sun, or like a moon, or like a universe of starry majesty, while he keeps onwards in his wondrous journey on the earth, or like a human form, a friend with whom he lived benevolent. As the eye of man views both east and west, encompassing its vortex, and the north and south with all their starry host. Also the rising sun and setting moon he views, surrounding his cornfields and his valleys of five hundred acres square. Thus is the earth one infinite plain, and not as apparent to the weak traveller, confined beneath the moony shade. Thus is the heaven a vortex past already, and the earth a vortex not yet passed by the traveller through eternity. First Milton saw Albion upon the Rock of Ages, Deadly pale, outstretched and snowy cold, storm covered, a giant form of perfect beauty outstretched on the rock in solemn death. The sea of time and space thundered aloud against the rock, which was enwrapped with the weeds of death. Hovering over the cold bosom in its vortex, Milton bent down to the bosom of death. What was underneath soon seemed above, a cloudy heaven mingled with stormy seas and loudest ruin. But as a wintry globe descends precipitant through Beulah, bursting with thunders loud and terrible, so Milton's shadow fell precipitant, loud thundering into the sea of time and space. Then first I saw him in the zenith as a falling star, descending perpendicular, swift as a swallow or swift. And on my left foot falling on the Tarsus, entered there. But from my left foot a black cloud redounding spread over Europe. 
Then Milton knew that the three heavens of Beulah were beheld by him on earth in his bright pilgrimage of sixty years. To annihilate the selfhood of deceit and false forgiveness, in those three females whom his wives and those three whom his daughters had represented and contained, that they might be resumed by giving up of selfhood. And they distant viewed his journey in their eternal spheres, now human, though their bodies remained closed in the dark all road till the judgment. Also Milton knew, they and himself was human, though now wandering through death's veil, in conflict with those female forms, which in blood and jealousy surrounded him, dividing and uniting without end or number. He saw the cruelties of Ulro, and he wrote them down in iron tablets, and his wives' and daughters' names were these, Rahab and Tirza, and Milka and Mala, and Noah and Hogla. They sat ranged round him, as the rocks of Horeb round the land of Canaan, and there wrote in thunder, smoke and fire his dictate. And his body was the rock Sinai, that body which was on earth born to corruption. And the six females are Hor, and Peor, and Bashan, and Abarim, and Lebanon, and Hermon, seven rocky masses terrible in the deserts of Midian. But Milton's human shadow continued journeying above the rocky masses of the mundane shell, in the lands of Edom, and Aram, and Moab, and Midian, and Amalek. The mundane shell is a vast concave earth, an immense hardened shadow of all things upon our vegetated earth, enlarged into dimension and deformed into indefinite space, in twenty-seven heavens and all their hells, with chaos and ancient night and purgatory. It is a cavernous earth of labyrinthine intricacy, twenty-seven folds of opaqueness, and finishes where the lark mounts. Here Milton journeyed in that region called Midian, among the rocks of Horeb. For travellers from eternity pass outward to Satan's seat, but travellers to eternity pass inward to Golganuza. Lost the vehicular terror beheld him, and divine Anathamon called all her daughters, saying, Surely to unloose my bond is this man come. Satan shall be unloosed upon Albion. Lost heard in terror Anathamon's words. In fibre strength, his limbs shot forth like roots of trees against the forward path of Milton's journey. Urizen beheld the immortal man, and Thamas, demon of the waters, and Orc, who was Luva. The shadowy female seeing Milton, howled in her lamentation over the deeps, outstretching her twenty-seven heavens over Albion, and thus the shadowy female howls, in articulate howlings. I will lament over Milton in the lamentations of the afflicted, my garments shall be woven of sighs and heartbroken lamentations. The misery of unhappy families shall be drawn out into its border, wrought with the needle with dire sufferings, poverty, pain and woe, along the rocky island, and thence throughout the whole earth. There shall be the sick father and his starving family, there the prisoner in his stone dungeon, and the slave at the mill. I will have writings written all over it in human words, that every infant that is born upon the earth shall read and get by rote as a hard task of a life of sixty years. I will have kings inwoven upon it, and counsellors and mighty men. The famine shall clasp it together with buckles and clasps, and the pestilence shall be its fringe and the war its girdle, to divide into Rahab and Tirza, that Milton may come to our tents. For I will put on the human form and take the image of God, even pity and humanity, but my clothing shall be cruelty, and I will put on holiness as a breastplate and as a helmet, and all my ornaments shall be of the gold of broken hearts, and the precious stones of anxiety and care and desperation and death, and repentance for sin and sorrow and punishment and fear. All my ornaments shall be of the gold of broken hearts, and the precious stones of anxiety and care and desperation and death, and repentance for sin and sorrow and punishment and fear to defend me from thy terrors, O Orc, my only beloved. Orc answered, Take not the human form, O loveliest, take not terror upon thee. Behold how I am, and tremble lest thou also consume in my consummation. But thou mayst take a form female and lovely, that cannot consume in man's consummation. Wherefore dost thou create and weave this Satan for a covering? When thou attemptest to put on the human form, 
My wrath burns to the top of heaven against thee in jealousy and fear. Then I rend thee asunder, then I howl over thy clay and ashes. When wilt thou put on the female form, as in times of old, with a garment of pity and compassion, like the garment of God? His garments are long sufferings for the children of men. Jerusalem is his garment, and not thy covering cherub, O lovely shadow of my delight, who wanderest seeking for the prey. So spoke Orc, when Uthun and Luetha hovered over his couch of fire, in interchange of beauty and perfection, in the darkness opening interiorly into Jerusalem and Babylon, shining glorious in the shadowy female's bosom. Jealous her darkness grew. Howlings filled all the desolate places in accusations of sin, in female beauty shining in the unformed void. And Orc in vain stretched out his hands of fire and wooed. They triumph in his pain. Thus darkened the shadowy female tenfold, and Orc tenfold glowed on his rocky couch against the darkness. Loud thunders told of the enormous conflict. Earthquake beneath, around, rent the immortal females limb from limb and joint from joint, and moved the fast foundations of the earth to wake the dead. You rise and emerge from his rocky form and from his snows, and he also darkened his brows, freezing dark rocks between the footsteps, and in fixing deep the feet in marble beds. Let Milton laboured with his journey, and his feet bled sore upon the clay, now changed to marble. Also you rise and rose, and met him on the shores of Arnon, and by the streams of the brooks. Silent they met, and silent strove among the streams of Arnon, even to Mahanaim, when with cold hand you rise and stoop down, and took up water from the river Jordan, pouring on to Milton's brain the icy fluid from his broad cold palm. But Milton took of the red clay of Succoth, moulding it with care between his palms, and filling up the furrows of many years, beginning at the feet of Urizen, and on the bones, creating new flesh on the demon cold, and building him as with new clay, a human form in the valley of Beth Peor. Four universes round the mundane egg remain chaotic, one to the north named Yothona, one to the south named Urizen, one to the east named Luva, one to the west named Tharmas. They are the four Zoas that stood around the throne divine. But when Luva assumed the world of Urizen to the south, and Albion was slain upon his mountains and in his tent, all fell towards the center in dire ruin sinking down. And in the south remains a burning fire, in the east a void, in the west a world of raging waters, in the north a solid, unfathomable, without end. But in the midst of these is built eternally the universe of Los and Enetharmon, towards which Milton went, but Urizen opposed his path. The man and demon strove many periods. Rahab beheld, standing on Carmel. Rahab and Tears are trembled to behold the enormous strife, one giving life, the other giving death to his adversary. And they sent forth all their sons and daughters, in all their beauty, to entice Milton across the river. The twofold form, hermaphroditic and the double sexed, the female male and the male female, self dividing stood before him in their beauty and in cruelties of holiness, shining in darkness, glorious upon the deeps of Enchuthon, saying, Come thou to Ephraim, behold the kings of Canaan, the beautiful Amalekites, behold the fires of youth bound with a chain of jealousy by Los and Enetharmon, the banks of Cam, cold learning streams, London's dark frowning towers lament upon the winds of Europe in Rephaim's vale, because Ahania, rent apart into a desolate night, laments, and Enion wanders like a weeping inarticulate voice, and Valor labours for her bread and water among the furnaces. Therefore bright tears are triumphs, putting on all beauty and all perfection in her cruel sports among the victims. Come, bring with thee Jerusalem with songs on the Grecian lyre, in natural religion, in experiments on men let her be offered up to holiness. Tears are numbers her, she numbers with her fingers every fibre ere it grow. Where is the Lamb of God? Where is the promise of his coming? Her shadowy sisters form the bones, even the bones of Horeb, around the marrow, and the orbed skull around the brain. His images are born for war, for sacrifice to Tirzah, to natural religion, 
to Tirza, the daughter of Rahab the Holy. She ties the knot of nervous fibres into a white brain. She ties the knot of bloody veins into a red-hot heart. Within her bosom, Albion lies embalmed, never to awake. Hand is become a rock. Sinai and Horeb is Hyle and Coburn. Schofield is bound in iron armour before Reuben's gate. She ties the knot of milky seed into two lovely heavens, two yet but one, each in the other sweet reflected. These are our three heavens beneath the shades of Beulah, land of rest. Come then to Ephraim and Menesi, O beloved one. Come to my ivory palaces, O beloved of thy mother, and let us bind thee in the bands of war, and be thou king of Canaan, and reign in Hazor, where the twelve tribes meet. So spoke they as in one voice. Silent, Milton stood before the darkened horizon, as the sculptor silent stands before his forming image. He walked round it, patient labouring. Thus Milton stood forming bright horizon, while his mortal part sat frozen in the rock of Horeb, and his redeemed portion thus formed the clay of horizon. But within that portion, his real human walked above in power and majesty, though darkened, and the seven angels of the presence attended him. Or how can I, with my gross tongue, that cleaveth to the dust, tell of the fourfold man in starry numbers fitly ordered? Or how can I, with my cold hand of clay? But thou, O Lord, do with me as thou wilt, for I am nothing in vanity. If thou choose to elect a worm, it shall remove the mountains. For that portion named the elect, the spectrous body of Milton, redounding from my left foot into Los's mundane space, brooded over his body in Horeb against the resurrection, preparing it for the great consummation. Red the cherub on Sinai glowed, but in terrors folded round his clouds of blood. Now Albion's sleeping humanity began to turn upon his couch, feeling the electric flame of Milton's awful precipitate descent. Seest thou the little winged fly, smaller than a grain of sand? It has a heart like thee, a brain open to heaven and hell, with inside wondrous and expansive. Its gates are not closed. I hope thine are not. Hence it clothes itself in rich array. Hence thou art clothed with human beauty, O thou mortal man. Seek not thy heavenly Father, then, beyond the skies. There chaos dwells in ancient night, and Og and Danak old. For every human heart has gates of brass, and bars of adamant, which few dare unbar, because dread Og and Danak guard the gates terrific. And each mortal brain is walled and moated round within, and Og and Danak watch here. Here is the seat of Satan in its webs. For in brain and heart and loins, gates open behind Satan's seat to the city of Golganusa, which is the spiritual fourfold London in the loins of Albion. Thus Milton fell through Albion's heart, travelling outside of humanity beyond the stars in chaos, in caverns of the mundane shell. But many of the Eternals rose up from eternal tables, drunk with the spirit. Burning round the couch of death, they stood looking down into Beulah. Wrathful, filled with rage, they rend the heavens round the watchers in a fiery circle, and round the shadowy eighth. The eight close up the couch into a tabernacle, and flee with cries down to the deeps where Los opens his three wide gates, surrounded by raging fires. They soon find their own place, and join the watchers of the Uro. Los saw them, and a cold pale horror covered o'er his limbs. Pondering he knew that Rintra and Palamabron might depart, even as Reuben and as Gad. Gave himself up to tears. He sat down on his anvil stock, and leaned upon the trough, looking into the black water, mingling it with tears. At last, when desperation almost tore his heart in twain, he recollected an old prophecy in Eden recorded, and often sung to the loud harp at immortal feasts, that Milton of the land of Albion should up ascend forwards from Uro, from the Vale of Felpham, and set free Orc from his chain of jealousy. He started at the thought, and down descended into Uden Aden. It was night, and Satan sat sleeping upon his couch in Uden Aden. His spectre slept, his shadow woke. When one sleeps, the other wakes. But Milton, entering my foot, 
I saw in the nether regions of the imagination, also all men on earth, and all in heaven saw, in the nether regions of the imagination, in Oro, beneath Beulah, the vast breach of Milton's descent. But I knew not that it was Milton, for man cannot know what passes in his members, till periods of space and time reveal the secrets of eternity. For more extensive than any earthly things are man's earthly lineaments. And all this vegetable world appeared on my left foot, as a bright sandal formed immortal of precious stones and gold. I stooped down and bound it on to walk forward through eternity. There is in Eden a sweet river of milk and liquid pearl, named Ololon, on whose mild banks dwelt those whom Milton drove down into Uro, and they wept in long resounding song for seven days of eternity. And the river's living banks, the mountains, wailed, and every living plant that grew in solemn sighs lamented. When Louvre's bulls each morning drag the sulphur sun out of the deep, harnessed with starry harness, black and shining, kept by slaves that work all night at the starry harness, strong and vigorous they drag the unwilling orb. At this time all the family of Eden heard the lamentation, and providence began. But when the clarions of day sounded, they drowned the lamentations, and when night came, all was silent in Ololon, and all refused to lament in the still night, fearing lest they should others molest. Seven mornings Los heard them, as the poor bird within the shell hears its impatient parent bird, and then a farm one heard them, but saw them not, for the blue mundane shell enclosed them in. And they lamented that they had in wrath and fury and fire driven Milton into the Uro, for now they knew too late that it was Milton the Awakener. They had not heard the bard, whose song called Milton to the attempt. And Los heard these laments. He heard them call in prayer all the divine family, and he beheld the cloud of Milton stretching over Europe. But all the family divine collected as four sons in the four points of heaven, east, west, and north, and south, enlarging and enlarging till their discs approached each other. And when they touched, closed together, southward in one sun, over Olalon. And as one man who weeps over his brother in a dark tomb, so all the family divine wept over Olalon, saying, Milton goes to eternal death. So saying, they groaned in spirit, and were troubled. And again the divine family groaned in spirit. And Olalon said, Let us descend also and let us give ourselves to death in Uro among the transgressors. Is virtue a punisher? Oh, no! How is this wondrous thing, this world beneath, unseen before, this refuge from the wars of great eternity, unnatural refuge, unknown by us till now, or are these the pangs of repentance? Let us enter into them. Then the Divine Family said, Six thousand years are now accomplished in this world of sorrow, Milton's angel knew the universal dictate, and you also feel this dictate. And now you know this world of sorrow and feel pity. Obey the dictate, watch over this world, and with your brooding wings renew it to eternal life. Lo, I am with you alway. But you cannot renew Milton. He goes to eternal death. So spake the family divine as one man, even Jesus, uniting in one with Ololon. And the appearance of one man, Jesus the Saviour, appeared coming in the clouds of Ololon. Though driven away with the seven starry ones into the Uro, yet the divine vision remains everywhere forever. Amen. And Ololon lamented for Milton with a great lamentation. While Los heard indistinct in fear, what time I bound my sandals on to walk forward through eternity, Los descended to me. And close behind me stood a terrible flaming sun, just close behind my back. I turned round in terror, and behold, Lo stood in that fierce glowing fire, and he also stooped down and bound my sandals on in Uden Aden. Trembling I stood exceedingly with fear and terror, standing in the vale of Lambeth. But he kissed me and wished me health, and I became one man with him, arising in my strength. Twas too late now to recede. Los had entered into my soul. His terrors now possessed me whole. I arose in fury and strength. 
I am that shadowy prophet who six thousand years ago fell from my station in the eternal bosom. Six thousand years are finished. I return. Both time and space obey my will. I in six thousand years walk up and down. For not one moment of time is lost, nor one event of space unpermanent. But all remain. Every fabric of six thousand years remains permanent. Though on earth where Satan fell and was cut off, all things vanish and are seen no more, they vanish not from me and mine. We guard them first and last. The generations of men run on in the tide of time, but they leave their destined lineaments permanent for ever and ever. So spoke Los as we went along to his supreme abode. Rintra and Palamabron met us at the gate of Golgonusa, clouded with discontent and brooding in their minds terrible things. They said, O Father most beloved, O merciful parent, pitying and permitting evil, though strong and mighty to destroy, whence is the shadow terrible? Wherefore dost thou refuse to throw him into the furnaces? Knowest thou not that he will unchain Orc, and let loose Satan, Og, Sihon, and Anak upon the body of Albion? For this he is come. Behold it written upon his fibrous left foot black, most dismal to our eyes. The shadowy female shudders through heaven in torment inexpressible, and all the daughters of Los prophetic wail. Yet in deceit they weave a new religion from new jealousy of Theotormon. Milton's religion is the cause. There is no end to destruction. Seeing the churches at their period, in terror and despair, Rahab created Voltaire, Tirza created Rousseau, asserting the self-righteousness against the universal saviour, mocking the confessions and martyrs, claiming self-righteousness, with cruel virtue making war upon the lambs redeemed, to perpetuate war and glory, to perpetuate the laws of sin. They perverted Swedenborg's visions in Beulah and in Ulro, to destroy Jerusalem as a harlot and her sons as reprobates, to raise up Mystery, the virgin harlot, mother of war, Babylon the Great, the abomination of desolation. O Swedenborg, strongest of men, the Samson shorn by the churches, showing the transgressors in hell, the proud warriors in heaven, heaven as a punisher, and hell as one under punishment, with laws from Plato and his Greeks to renew the Trojan gods in Albion, and to deny the value of the Saviour's blood. But then I raised up Whitefield, Palamabron raised up Wesley, and these are the cries of the churches before the two witnesses. Faith in God, the dear Saviour, who took on the likeness of men, becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross. The witnesses lie dead in the street of the great city. No faith is in all the earth. The book of God is trodden underfoot. He sent his two servants, Whitefield and Wesley. Were they prophets, or were they idiots or madmen? Show us miracles. Can you have greater miracles than these? Men who devote their lives whole comfort to entire scorn and injury and death. Awake, thou sleeper on the rock of eternity. Albion, awake. The trumpet of judgment hath twice sounded. All nations are awake, but thou art still heavy and dull. Awake, Albion, awake. Lo, Orc arises on the Atlantic. Lo, his blood and fire glow on America's shore. Albion turns upon his couch. He listens to the sounds of war, astonished and confounded. He weeps into the Atlantic deep, yet still in dismal dreams unwakened and the covering cherub advances from the east. How long shall we lay dead in the streets of the great city? How long beneath the covering cherub give our emanations? Milton will utterly consume us and thee, our beloved father. He hath entered into the covering cherub, becoming one with Albion's dread sons. Hand, Hyle, and Coburn surround us as a girdle, Gwendolen and Conwenna as a garment woven of war and religion. Let us descend and bring him chained to Bolahula, O Father most beloved, O mild parent, cruel in thy mildness, pitying and permitting evil, though strong and mighty to destroy, O Los, our beloved Father. Like the black storm coming out of chaos beyond the stars, it issues through the dark and intricate caves of the mundane shell, passing the planetary visions and the well-adorned firmament. The sun rolls into chaos, and the stars into the deserts, and then the storms become visible, audible, and terrible, covering the light of day and rolling down upon the mountains, deluge all the country round. 
such as a vision of Los, when Rintra and Palamabron spake, and such his stormy face appeared, as does the face of heaven when covered with thick storms, pitying and loving though in frowns of terrible perturbation. End of section 3 Milton by William Blake Section 4 But Los dispersed the clouds, even as the strong winds of Jehovah, and Los thus spoke. O noble sons, be patient yet a little while. I have embraced the falling death. He has become one with me. O sons, we live not by wrath. By mercy alone we live. I recollect an old prophecy in Eden, recorded in gold, and oft sung to the harp, that Milton of the land of Albion should up ascend forward from Felpham's vale, and break the chain of jealousy from all its roots. Be patient therefore, O my sons. These lovely females form sweet night and silence and secret obscurities, to hide from Satan's watch-fiends human loves and graces, lest they write them in their books and in the scroll of mortal life, to condemn the accused, who at Satan's bar tremble in spectrous bodies continually day and night, while on the earth they live in sorrowful vegetations. O oh, when shall we tread our wine-presses in heaven, and weep our wheat with shoutings of joy, and leave the earth in peace? Remember how Calvin and Luther, in fury premature, sowed war and stern division between Papists and Protestants. Let it not be so now. O oh, go not forth in martyrdoms and wars. We were placed here by the universal brotherhood and mercy, with powers fitted to circumscribe this dark satanic death and that the seven eyes of God may have space for redemption. But how this is as yet we know not, and we cannot know till Albion is arisen. Then patient wait a little while. Six thousand years are passed away. The end approaches fast. This mighty one has come from Eden. He is of the elect. He is of the elect who died from earth, and he is returned before the judgment. This thing was never known, that one of the holy dead should willing return. Then patient wait a little while, till the last vintage is over, till we have quenched the son of Sailor in the lake of Udenaden. O oh, my dear sons, leave not your father, as your brethren left me. Twelve sons successive fled away in that thousand years of sorrow, of Palamabron's harrow, and Rintra's wrath and fury. Reuben, and Manazoth, and Gad, and Simeon, and Levi, and Ephraim, and Judah were generated because they left me wandering with tears, Enathamon wept one thousand years, and all the earth was in a watery deluge. We called him Manasi, because of the generations of tears, because of Satan, and the seven eyes of God continually guard round them. But I, the fourth sower, am also set the watchman of eternity. The three are not, and I am preserved. Still my four mighty ones are left to me in Golganuza. Still Rintra fierce, and Palamabron mild and piteous, Theotomon filled with care, Bromion loving science. You, O oh my sons, still guard round Los, O oh, wander not and leave me. Rintra, thou well rememberest, when Amalek and Canaan fled with their sister Moab into that abhorred void. They became nations in our sight beneath the hands of Tirzah. And Palamabron, thou rememberest, when Joseph, an infant, stolen from his nurse's cradle, wrapped in needlework of emblematic texture, was sold to the Amalekite, who carried him down into Egypt, where Ephraim and Manasseh gathered my sons together in the sands of Midian. And if you also flee away and leave your father's side, following Milton into Uro, although your power is great, surely you also shall become poor mortal vegetations beneath the moon of Uro. Pity then your father's tears, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, I stood and saw Lazarus, who is the vehicular body of Albion the redeemed, arise into the covering cherub, who is the spectre of Albion. By martyrdoms to suffer, to watch over the sleeping body upon his rock beneath his tomb, I saw the covering cherub divide fourfold into four churches when Lazarus arose, Paul, Constantine, Charlemagne, Luther. Behold, they stand before us, stretched over Europe and Asia. Come, O sons, come, come away, 
Arise, O sons, give all your strength against eternal death, lest we are vegetated. For Cathedron's looms weave only death, a web of death, and were it not for Bolahula and Alamander, no human form but only a fibrous vegetation, a polypus of soft affections, without thought or vision, must tremble in the heavens and earths through all the Uro space. Throw all the vegetated mortals into Bolahula. But as to this elected form, who has returned again, he is the signal that the last vintage now approaches, nor vegetation may go on till all the earth is reaped. Solo spoke. Furious they descended to Bolahula and Alamanda, indignant, unconvinced by Los's arguments and thunders rolling. They saw that wrath now swayed and now pity absorbed him. As it was, so it remained, and no hope of an end. Bolahula is named law by mortals. Thamas founded it because of Satan, before Lubin in the city of Golganuza. But Golganuza is named art and manufacture by mortal men. In Bolahula, Los's anvils stand, and his furnaces rage. Thundering the hammers beat, and the bellows blow loud, living, self-moving, mourning, lamenting and howling incessantly. Bolahula through all its porches feels, though too fast founded its pillars and porticos, to tremble at the force of mortal or immortal arm. And softly lilling flutes, accordant with the horrid labours, make sweet melody. The bellows are the animal lungs, the hammers the animal heart, the furnaces the stomach for digestion. Terrible their fury. Thousands and thousands labour, thousands play on instruments, stringed or fluted, to ameliorate the sorrows of slavery. Loud sport the dancers in the dance of death, rejoicing in carnage. The hard, dentent hammers are lulled by the flutes lula lula. The bellowing furnaces blare by the long-sounding clarion. The double drum drowns howls and groans. The shrill fife shrieks and cries. The crooked horn mellows the hoarse, raving serpent. Terrible but harmonious. Bolahula is the stomach in every individual man. Los is by mortals named Time. And Thamon is named Space. But they depict him bald and aged, who is an eternal youth, all-powerful, and his locks flourish like the brows of morning. He is the spirit of prophecy, the ever-apparent Elias. Time is the mercy of eternity. Without time's swiftness, which is the swiftness of all things, all were eternal torment. All the gods of the kingdoms of earth labour in Los's halls. Every one is a fallen son of the spirit of prophecy. He is the fourth Zoa that stood around the throne divine. Loud shout the sons of Luva at the wine presses as Los descended, with Rintra and Palamabron in his fires of resistless fury. The wine press on the Rhine groans loud. But all its central beams act more terrific in the central cities of the nations, where human thought is crushed beneath the iron hand of power. There Los puts all into the press, the oppressor and the oppressed together, ripe for the harvest and vintage, and ready for the loom. They sang at the vintage. This is the last vintage, and seed shall no more be sown upon earth till all the vintage is over, and all gathered in till the plough has passed over the nations, and the harrow and heavy thundering roller upon the mountains. And louder souls howl round the porches of Golgonooza, crying, O God, deliver us to the heavens or to the earths, that we may preach righteousness and punish the sinner with death. But Los refused, till all the vintage of earth was gathered in. And Los stood and cried to the labourers of the vintage, in voice of all, Fellow labourers, the great vintage and harvest is now upon the earth. The whole extent of the globe is explored. Every scattered atom of human intellect now is flocking to the sound of the trumpet. All the wisdom which was hidden in caves and dens from ancient time is now sought out from animal and vegetable and mineral. Every scattered atom of human intellect is now flocking to the sound of the trumpet. All the wisdom which was hidden in caves and dens from ancient time is now sought out from animal and vegetable and mineral. The Awakener is come outstretched over Europe. 
the vision of God is fulfilled. The ancient man upon the rock of Albion awakes. He listens to the sounds of war, astonished and ashamed. He sees his children mock at faith and deny providence. Therefore you must bind the sheaves not by nations or families. You shall bind them in three classes, according to their classes. So shall you bind them, separating what has been mixed since men began to be wove into nations by Rahab and Tirzah, since Albion's death and Satan's cutting off from our awful fields, when under pretense to benevolence the elect subdued all from the foundation of the world. The elect is one class. You shall bind them separate. They cannot believe in eternal life except by miracle and a new birth. The other two classes, the reprobate who never cease to believe, and the redeemed who live in doubts and fears perpetually tormented by the elect, these you shall bind into a twin bundle for the consummation. But the elect must be saved from fires of eternal death, to be formed into the churches of Beulah, that they destroy not the earth. For in every nation and every family the three classes are born, and in every species of earth, metal, tree, fish, bird and beast. We form the mundane egg, the spectres coming by fury or amity, all is the same, and every one remains in his own energy. Go forth, reapers, with rejoicing. You sowed in tears, but the time of your refreshing cometh. Only a little moment still abstain from pleasure and rest in the labours of eternity, and you shall reap the whole earth from pole to pole, from sea to sea, beginning at Jerusalem's inner court, Lambeth, ruined and given to the detestable gods of Priam, to Apollo, and at the asylum given to Hercules, who labour in tears as looms for bread, who set pleasure against duty, who create Olympic crowns to make learning a burden, and the work of the Holy Spirit strife. The Thor and cruel Odin, who first reared the polar caves. Lambeth mourns, calling Jerusalem. She weeps and looks abroad for the Lord's coming, that Jerusalem may overspread all the nations. Crave not for the mortal and perishing delights, but leave them to the weak, and pity the weak as your infant care. Break not forth in your wrath, lest you also are vegetated by Tirzah. Wait till the last judgment is past, till the creation is consumed, and then rush forward with me into the glorious spiritual vegetation, the supper of the Lamb and his bride, and the awaking of Albion, our friend and ancient companion. So low spoke, but lightnings of discontent broke on all sides round, and murmurs of thunder rolling heavy, long and loud over the mountains, while Los called his sons around him to the harvest and the vintage. Thou seest the constellations in the deep and wondrous night. They rise in order and continue their immortal courses upon the mountains and in veils with harp and heavenly song, with flute and clarion, with cups and measures filled with foaming wine. Glittering the streams reflect the vision of beatitude, and the calm ocean joys beneath and smooths his awful waves. These are the sons of Los, and these the labourers of the vintage. Thou sees the gorgeous clothed flies that dance and sport in summer upon the sunny brooks and meadows. Every one the dance knows in its intricate mazes of delight, artful to weave. Each one to sound his instruments of music in the dance, to touch each other and recede, to cross and change in return. These are the children of Los. Thou seest the trees on mountains, the wind blows heavy, loud they thunder through the darksome sky, uttering prophecies and speaking instructive words to the sons of men. These are the sons of Los, these the visions of eternity. But we see only as it were the hem of their garments, when with our vegetable eyes we view these wondrous visions. There are two gates through which all souls descend, one southward from Dovercliff to Lizard Point, the other toward the north, Caithness and Rocky Durness, Pentland and John Groat's house. The souls descending to the body wail on the right hand of Los, and those delivered from the body on the left hand. For Los, against the east his force continually bends, along the valleys of Middlesex, from Hounslow to Blackheath, lest those three heavens of Beulah should the creation destroy, and lest they should descend before the north and south gates, groaning with pity, he among the wailing souls laments. And these the labours of the sons of Los in Alamander, and in the city of Golganusa, and in Lubin, around the lake of Udenaden, 
in the forests of Enchuthon Benethon, where souls incessant wail, being piteous passions and desires, with neither lineament nor form, but like to watery clouds, the passions and desires descend upon the hungry winds. For such alone sleepers remain, mere passion and appetite. The sons of Los clothe them, and feed and provide houses and fields. And every generated body in its inward form is a garden of delight and a building of magnificence, built by the sons of Los in Bolahula and Alamanda. And the herbs and flowers and furniture and beds and chambers continually woven in the looms of Enitharmon's daughters, in bright Cathedron's golden dome, with care and love and tears. For the various classes of men are all marked out determinates in Bolahula, and as the spectres choose their affinities, so they are born on earth, and every class is determinate, but not by natural, but by spiritual power alone, because the natural power continually seeks and tends to destruction, ending in death, which would of itself be eternal death, and all are classed by spiritual and not by natural power. And every natural effect has a spiritual cause, and not a natural, for a natural cause only seems. It is a delusion of Ulro, and a ratio of the perishing vegetable memory. But the winepress of Los is eastward of Golganuza, before the seat of Satan. Luva laid the foundation, and Urizen finished it in howling woe. How read the sons and daughters of Luva? Here they tread the grapes, Laughing and shouting, drunk with odours, many fall o'er-wearied, drowned in the wine as many a youth and maiden. Those around lay them on skins of tigers, and of the spotted leopard, and the wild ass, till they revive, or bury them in cool grots, making lamentation. This wine-press is called war on earth. It is the printing-press of Los. And here he lays his words in order, above the mortal brain, as cogs are formed in a wheel, to turn the cogs of the adverse wheel. Timbrels and violins sport round the wine presses, the little seed, the sportive root, the earthworm, the gold beetle, the wise emmet dance round the wine presses of Luva. The centipede is there, the ground spider with many eyes, the mole clothed in velvet, the ambitious spider in his sullen web, the lucky golden spinner, the earwig armed, the tender maggot, emblem of immortality, the flea, louse, bug, the tapeworm, all the armies of disease, visible or invisible to the slothful vegetating man. The slow slug, the grasshopper that sings and laughs and drinks. Winter comes, he folds his slender bones without a murmur. The cruel scorpion is there, the gnat, wasp, hornet and the honeybee. The toad and venomous newt, the serpent clothed in gems and gold. They throw off their gorgeous raiment. They rejoice with loud jubilee around the wine presses of Luva, naked and drunk with wine. There is the nettle that stings with soft down, and there the indignant thistle whose bitterness is bred in his milk, who feeds on contempt of his neighbour. There all the idle weeds that creep around the obscure places show their various limbs, naked in all their beauty, dancing round the wine presses. But in the wine presses the human grapes sing not nor dance. They howl and writhe in shoals of torment, in fierce flames consuming, in chains of iron, and in dungeons circled with ceaseless fires, in pits and dens and shades of death, in shapes of torment and woe. The plates and screws and racks and saws and cords and fires and cisterns, the cruel joys of Luva's daughters, lacerating with knives and whips their victims, and the deadly sport of Luva's sons. They dance around the dying, and they drink the howl and groan. They catch the shrieks and cups of gold. They hand them one to another. These are the sports of love, and these the sweet delights of amorous play. Tears of the grape, the death sweat of the cluster, the last sigh of the mild youth, who listens to the luring songs of Luva. But Alamanda, called on earth commerce, is the cultivated land around the city of Golganuza, in the forests of Enchuthon, here the sons of Los labour against death eternal, through all the twenty-seven heavens of Beulah in Oro, seat of Satan, which is the false tongue beneath Beulah. It is the sense of touch. The plough goes forth in tempests and lightnings, and the harrow cruel in blights of the east. The heavy roller follows in howlings of woe. Urizen's sons here labour also, and here are seen the mills of Theotormon on the verge of the lake of Udenaden. 
These are the starry voids of night and the depths and caverns of earth. These mills are oceans, clouds and waters ungovernable in their fury. Here are the stars created and the seeds of all things planted, and here the sun and moon receive their fixed destinations. But in eternity, the four arts, poetry, painting, music and architecture, which is science, are the four faces of man. Not so in time and space. There three are shut out, and only science remains through mercy. And by means of science, the three become apparent in time and space, in the three professions. Poetry and religion, music, law, painting and physic and surgery. That man may live upon earth till the time of his awaking. And from these three, science derives every occupation of men, and science is divided into Bolahula and Alamanda. Some sons of Los surround the passions with porches of iron and silver, creating form and beauty around the dark regions of sorrow, giving to airy nothing a name and a habitation delightful, with bounds to the infinite putting off the indefinite into most holy forms of thought. Such is the power of inspiration, they labour incessant with many tears and afflictions, creating the beautiful house for the piteous sufferer. Others' cabinets richly fabricate of gold and ivory for doubts and fears unformed and wretched and melancholy. The little weeping spectre stands on the threshold of death eternal, and sometimes two spectres like lamps quivering, and often malignant they combat, heartbreaking, sorrowful and piteous. Antamon takes them into his beautiful, flexible hands, as the sower takes the seed, or as the artist his clay or fine wax, to mould artful a model for golden ornaments. The soft hands of Antamon draw the indelible line, form immortal with golden pen, such as the spectre admiring puts on the sweet form. Then smiles Antamon bright through his windows. The daughters of beauty look up from their loom and prepare the integument soft for its clothing with joy and delight. But Theotomon and Sotha stand in the gate of Lubin anxious. Their numbers are seven million and seven thousand and seven hundred. They contend with the weak spectres. They fabricate soothing forms. The spectre refuses. He seeks cruelty. They create the crested cock. Terrified, the spectre screams and rushes in fear into their net of kindness and compassion, and is born a weeping terror. Or they create the lion and tiger in compassionate thunderings. Howling, the spectres flee. They take refuge in human lineaments. The sons of Ozoth within the optic nerve stand fiery glowing, and the number of his sons is eight millions and eight. They give delights to the man unknown. Artificial riches they give to scorn, and the possessors to trouble and sorrow and care, shutting the sun and moon and stars and trees and clouds and waters and hills out from the optic nerve, and hardening it into a bone opaque, and like the black pebble on the enraged beach, while the poor indigent is like the diamond which, though clothed in rugged covering in the mine, is open all within, and in his hallowed centre holds the heavens of bright eternity. Ozoth here builds walls of rocks against the surging sea, and timbers cramped with iron cramps bar in the joys of life from fell destruction and the spectrous cunning or rage. He creates the speckled newt, the spider and beetle, the rat and mouse, the badger and fox. They worship before his feet in trembling fear. But others of the sons of Los build moments and minutes and hours and days and months and years and ages and periods, wondrous buildings, and every moment has a couch of gold for soft repose. A moment equals a pulsation of the artery. And between every two moments stands a daughter of Beulah, to feed the sleepers on their couches with maternal care. And every minute has an azure tent with silken veils. And every hour has a bright golden gate carved with skill. And every day and night has walls of brass and gates of adamant, shining like precious stones and ornamented with appropriate signs. And every month has a silver paved terrace builded high and every year invulnerable barriers with high towers, and every age is moated deep with bridges of silver and gold, and every seven ages is encircled with a flaming fire. Now seven ages is amounting to two hundred years. Each has its guard, each moment, minute, hour, day, month and year. All are the work of fairy hands of the four elements. The guard are angels of providence on duty evermore, Every time less than a pulsation of the artery is equal in its period and value to six thousand years. For in this period the poet's work is done, 
and all the great events of time start forth and are conceived in such a period, within a moment, a pulsation of the artery. The sky is an immortal tent built by the sons of Los, and every space that a man views around his dwelling place, standing on his own roof, or in his garden on a mount of twenty-five cubits in height, such space is his universe. And on its verge the sun rises and sets. The clouds bow to meet the flat earth and sea in such an ordered space. The starry heavens reach no further, but here bend and set on all sides, and the two poles turn on their valves of gold. And if he move his dwelling place, his heavens also move where'er he goes, and all his neighbourhood bewail his loss. Such are the spaces called earth, and such its dimension. As to that false appearance, which appears to the reasoner, as of a globe rolling through voidness, it is a delusion of Uro. The microscope knows not of this, nor the telescope. They alter the ratio of the spectator's organs, but leave objects untouched. For every space larger than a red globule of man's blood is visionary, and is created by the hammer of Los, and every space smaller than a globule of man's blood opens into eternity, of which this vegetable earth is but a shadow. The red globule is the unwearied sun by Los created to measure time and space to mortal men every morning. Bolahula and Alamanda are placed on each side of that pulsation and that globule. Terrible their power. But Rintra and Palamabron govern over day and night in Alamanda and in Enchuthon Benathon, where souls wail, where orc incessant howls, burning in fires of eternal youth, within the vegetated mortal nerves. For every man born is joined within into one mighty polypus, and this polypus is orc. But in the optic vegetative nerves, sleep was transformed to death in old time by Satan, the father of sin and death. And Satan is the spectre of orc, and orc is the generate louver. But in the nerves of the nostrils, accident being formed into substance and principle by the cruelties of demonstration, it became opaque and indefinite. But the divine saviour formed it into a solid by Los's mathematic power. He named the opaque Satan, he named the solid Adam. And in the nerves of the ear, for the nerves of the tongue are closed, on Albion's rock Los stands creating the glorious sun each morning, and when unwearied in the evening, he creates the moon, death to delude, who all in terror at their splendour leaves his prey, while Los appoints Rintra and Palamabron to guide the souls clear from the rock of death, that death himself may wake in his appointed season when the ends of heaven meet. Then Los conducts the spirits to be vegetated into great Golgonooza, free from the four iron pillars of Satan's throne, temperance, prudence, justice, fortitude, the four pillars of tyranny, that Satan's watch-fiends touch them not before they vegetate. But Enetharmon and her daughters take the pleasant charge, to give them to their lovely heavens till the great judgment day. Such is their lovely charge. But Rahab and Tirzah pervert their mild influences. Therefore the seven eyes of God walk round the three heavens of Ulro, where Tirzah and her sisters weave the black woof of death upon Enchuthon Benathon, in the Vale of Surrey, where Horeb terminates in Rephaim. The stamping feet of Zelophehad's daughters are covered with human gore upon the treadles of the loom. They sing to the winged shuttle. The river rises above his banks to wash the woof. He takes it in his arms. He passes it in strength through his current. The veil of human miseries is woven over the ocean, from the Atlantic to the great South Sea, the Erythraean. Such is the world of Los, the labour of six thousand years. Thus nature is a vision of the science of the Elohim. End of the first book. End of section four. Milton by William Blake. Section five. There is a place where contrarieties are equally true. This place is called Beulah. It is a pleasant, lovely shadow where no dispute can come because of those who sleep. Into this place the sons and daughters of Ololon descended with solemn mourning into Beulah's moony shades and hills, weeping for Milton. Mute wonder held the daughters of Beulah, enraptured with affection, sweet and mild benevolence. 
Beulah is ever more created around eternity, appearing to the inhabitants of Eden around them on all sides. But Beulah to its inhabitants appears within each district as the beloved infant in his mother's bosom, round and circled with arms of love and pity and sweet compassion. But to the sons of Eden, the moony habitations of Beulah are from great eternity a mild and pleasant rest. And it is thus created, Lo, the eternal great humanity, to whom be glory and dominion evermore, Amen, walks among all his awful family, seen in every face, as the breath of the Almighty, such are the words of man to man, in the great wars of eternity, in fury of poetic inspiration, to build a universe stupendous, mental forms creating. But the emanations trembled exceedingly, nor could they live, because the life of man was too exceeding unbounded. His joy became terrible to them. They trembled and wept, crying with one voice, Give us a habitation and a place in which we may be hidden under the shadow of wings. For if we, who are but for a time, and who pass away in winter, behold these wonders of eternity, we shall consume. But you, our fathers and brothers, remain in eternity. But grant us a temporal habitation. Do you speak to us? We will obey your words as you obey Jesus the Eternal, who is blessed for ever and ever. Amen. So spake the lovely emanations, and there appeared a pleasant, mild shadow above, beneath, and on all sides round. Into this pleasant shadow, all the weak and weary, like women and children, were taken away as on wings of dove-like softness, and shadowy habitations prepared for them. But every man returned and went still going forward through the bosom of the Father, in eternity on eternity. Neither did any lack or fall into error without a shadow to repose, in all the days of happy eternity. Into this pleasant shadow, Beulah, all Ololon descended, and when the daughters of Beulah heard the lamentation, all Beulah wept, for they saw the Lord coming in the clouds, and the shadows of Beulah terminate in rocky Albion. And all nations wept in affliction, family by family. Germany wept towards France and Italy, England wept and trembled towards America. India rose up from his golden bed as one awakened in the night. They saw the Lord coming in the clouds of Ololon with power and great glory. And all the living creatures of the four elements wailed with bitter wailing. These in the aggregate are named Satan and Rahab. They know not of regeneration, but only of generation. The fairies, nymphs, gnomes and genii of the four elements, unforgiving and unalterable, these cannot be regenerated, but must be created, for they know only of generation. These are the gods of the kingdoms of the earth, in contrarious and cruel opposition, element against element, opposed in war, not mental, as the wars of eternity, but a corporeal strife in Losis halls, continual labouring in the furnaces of Golganuza. Orc howls on the Atlantic, Enathamon trembles, all Beulah weeps. Thou hearest the nightingale begin the song of spring. The lark, sitting upon his earthy bed, just as the morn appears, listens silent. Then springing from the waving cornfield, loud he leads the choir of the day. Trill, 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 trill. Mounting upon the wings of light into the great expanse, re-echoing against the lovely blue and shining heavenly shell, his little throat labours with inspiration. Every feather on throat and breast and wings vibrates with the effluence divine. All nature listens silent to him, and the awful sun stands still upon the mountain, looking on this little bird, with eyes of soft humility and wonder, love and awe. Then loud from their green covert, all the birds begin their song. The thrush, the linnet and the goldfinch, robin and the wren, Awake the sun from his sweet reverie upon the mountain. The nightingale again essays his song, And through the day and through the night, Warbles luxuriant, Every bird of song attending his loud harmony With admiration and love. This is a vision of the lamentation of Beulah over Ololon. Thou perceivest the flowers put forth their precious odours, 
and none can tell how from so small a centre comes such sweets, forgetting that within that centre eternity expands its ever-during doors that Og and Anak fiercely guard. First, ere the morning breaks, joy opens in the flowery bosoms, joy even to tears, which the sun rising dries. First the wild thyme, and meadow sweet, downy and soft, waving among the reeds. Light springing on the air, lead the sweet dance. They wake the honeysuckle sleeping on the oak. The flaunting beauty revels along upon the wind. The white thorn, lovely May, opens her many lovely eyes listening. The rose still sleeps, none dare to wake her. Soon she bursts her crimson curtained bed, and comes forth in the majesty of beauty. Every flower, the pink, the jessamine, the wallflower, the carnation, the jonquil, the mild lily, opes her heavens. Every tree and flower and herb soon fill the air with an innumerable dance. Yet all in order sweet and lovely, men are sick with love. Such is a vision of the lamentation of Beulah over Ololon. And Milton oft sat upon the couch of death, and oft conversed in vision and dream beatific with the seven angels of the presence. I have turned my back upon these heavens builded on cruelty. My spectre still wandering through them follows my emanation. He hunts her footsteps through the snow and the wintry hail and rain. The idiot reasoner laughs at the man of imagination, and from laughter proceeds to murder by undervaluing calumny. Then Hillel, who is Lucifer, replied over the couch of death, and thus the seven angels instructed him, and thus they converse. We are not individuals but states, combinations of individuals. We were angels of the divine presence, and were druids in Annandale, compelled to combine into form by Satan, the spectre of Albion, who made himself a god and destroyed the human form divine. But the divine humanity and majesty gave us a human form because we were combined in freedom and holy brotherhood. While those combined by Satan's tyranny, first in the blood of war and sacrifice, and next in chains of imprisonment, are shapeless rocks, retaining only Satan's mathematic holiness, length, breadth, and height. Calling the human imagination, which is the divine vision and fruition in which man liveth eternally, madness and blasphemy, against its own qualities, which are servants of humanity, not gods or lords. Distinguish therefore states from individuals in those states. States change, but individual identities never change nor cease. You cannot go to eternal death in that which can never die. Satan and Adam are states created into twenty-seven churches, and thou, O Milton, art a state about to be created, called eternal annihilation, that none but the living shall dare to enter, and they shall enter triumphant over death and hell and the grave. States that are not, but are, seem to be. Judge then of thy own self. Thy eternal lineaments explore what is eternal and what is changeable and what annihilable. The imagination is not a state, it is the human existence itself. Affection or love becomes a state when divided from imagination. The memory is a state always, and the reason is a state, created to be annihilated, and a new ratio created. Whatever can be created can be annihilated. Forms cannot. The oak is cut down by the axe, the lamb falls by the knife, but their forms eternal exist forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Thus they converse with the dead, watching round the couch of death. For God himself enters death's door always, with those that enter, and lays down in the grave with them, in visions of eternity, till they awake and see Jesus, and the linen clothes lying that the females had woven for them, and the gates of their father's house. And the divine voice was heard in the songs of Beulah, saying, When first I married you, I gave you all my whole soul. I thought that you would love my loves and joy my delights, seeking for pleasures and my pleasures, O daughter of Babylon. Then thou wast lovely, mild and gentle. Now thou art terrible in jealousy and unlovely in my sight, because thou hast cruelly cut off my loves in fury till I have no love left for thee. 
Thy love depends on him thou lovest, and on his dear loves depend thy pleasures, which thou hast cut off by jealousy. Therefore I show my jealousy, and set before you death. Behold Milton descended to redeem the female shade from death eternal. Such your lot, to be continually redeemed by death and misery of those you love and by annihilation. When the sixfold female perceives that Milton annihilates himself, that seeing all his loves by her cut off, he leaves her also, entirely abstracting himself from female loves, she shall relent in fear of death. She shall begin to give her maidens to her husband, delighting in his delight. And then, and then alone, begins the happy female joy, as it is done in Beulah. And thou, O virgin Babylon, mother of whoredoms, shalt bring Jerusalem in thine arms in the night watches, and no longer turning her a wandering harlot in the streets, shalt give her into the arms of God your Lord and husband. Such are the songs of Beulah in the lamentation of Ololon. And all the songs of Beulah sounded comfortable notes to comfort Ololon's lamentation, for they said, are you the fiery circle that late drove in fury and fire the eight immortal starry ones down into Uro dark, rending the heavens of Beulah with your thunderings and lightnings? And can you thus lament, and can you pity and forgive? Is terror changed to pity, a wonder of eternity? And the four states of humanity in its repose were showed them, first of Beulah, a most pleasant sleep on soft couches, soft with mild music, tended by flowers of Beulah, sweet female forms, winged or floating in the air spontaneous. The second state is Allah, and the third state al Uro. But the fourth state is dreadful, it is named or Uro. The first state is in the head, the second is in the heart, the third in the loins, and seminal vessels, and the fourth in the stomach and intestines terrible, deadly, unutterable. And he whose gates are open in those regions of his body can from those gates view all these wondrous imaginations. But all along sought the or Uro and its fiery gates and the couches of the martyrs and many daughters of Beulah. And many daughters of Beulah accompany them down to Uro with soft melodious tears, a long journey and dark through chaos in the track of Milton's course to where the contraries of Beulah war beneath negation's banner. Then viewed from Milton's track, they see the Uro, a vast polypus of living fibres down into the sea of time and space, growing a self-devouring monstrous human death twenty-sevenfold. Within it sit five females and the nameless shadowy mother, spinning it from their bowels with songs of amorous delight and melting cadences that lure the sleepers of Beulah down the river Storge, which is Arnon, into the Dead Sea. Around this polypus, Los Continual builds the mundane shell. Four universes round the universe of Los remain chaotic, four intersecting globes, and the egg-formed world of Los in midst, stretching from Zenith to Nadir in midst of chaos. One of these ruined universes is to the north, named Euthona, one to the south, this was the glorious world of Urizen, one to the east of Luva, one to the west of Thamas. But when Luva assumed the world of Urizen in the south, all fell towards the centre, sinking downward in dire ruin. Here in these chaoses, the sons of Ololon took their abode, in chasms of the mundane shell, which open on all sides round, southward and by the east within the breach of Milton's descent to watch the time, pitying and gentle to awaken Urizen. They stood in a dark land of death, of fiery corroding waters, where lie in evil death the four immortals, pale and cold, and the eternal man, even Albion, upon the rock of ages. Seeing Milton's shadow, some daughters of Beulah trembling returned, but Ololon remained before the gates of the dead. And Ololon looked down into the heavens of Oro in fear, they said, How are the wars of man, which in great eternity appear around in the external spheres of visionary life, here rendered deadly within the life and interior vision? How are the beasts and birds and fishes and plants and minerals, here fixed into a frozen bulk, 
subject to death and decay. Those visions of human life and shadows of wisdom and knowledge are here frozen to unexpensive, deadly, destroying terrors. And war and hunting, the two fountains of the river of life, are become fountains of bitter death and of corroding hell, till brotherhood is changed into a curse and a flattery by differences between ideas, that ideas themselves, which are the divine members, may be slain in offerings for sin. O dreadful loom of death! O piteous female forms compelled to weave the woof of death! On Camberwell, Tirza's courts, Malas on Blackheath, Rahab and Noah dwell on Windsor's heights, where once the cherubs of Jerusalem spread to Lambeth's vale, Milka's pillars shine from Harrow to Hampstead, where Hogler on Highgate's heights magnificent weaves over trembling Thames to Shooter's Hill and thence to Blackheath, the dark wolf. Loud, loud roll the weights and spindles over the whole earth, let down on all sides round to the four quarters of the world, eastward on Europe to Euphrates and Hindu to Nile, and back in clouds of death across the Atlantic to America north and south. End of section 5 Milton by William Blake, section 6 So spake Ololon in reminiscence astonished, but they could not behold Golgonuza without passing the Polypus, a wondrous journey not passable by immortal feet, and none but the divine Saviour can pass it without annihilation. For Golgonuza cannot be seen till having passed the Polypus, it is viewed on all sides round by a fourfold vision, or till you become mortal and vegetable in sexuality, then you behold its mighty spires and domes of ivory and gold. And Ololon examined all the couches of the dead, even of Los and Enitharmon and all the sons of Albion, and his four Zoas terrified and on the verge of death, in midst of these was Milton's couch. And when they saw eight immortal starry ones guarding the couch in flaming fires, they thunderous uttered all a universal groan falling down, prostrate before the starry eight, asking with tears forgiveness, confessing their crime with humiliation and sorrow. Oh, how the starry eight rejoiced to see Ololon descended! And now that a wide road was open to eternity by Ololon's descent through Beula to Los and Enitharmon, for mighty were the multitudes of Ololon, vast the extent of their great sway, reaching from Alro to eternity surrounding the mundane shell outside in its caverns, and through Beula, and all silent forbore to contend with Ololon, for they saw the Lord in the clouds of Ololon. There is a moment in each day that Satan cannot find, nor can his watch fiends find it, but the industrious find this moment, and it multiply, and when it once is found, it renovates every moment of the day if rightly placed. In this moment Ololon descended to Los and Enitharmon, unseen beyond the mundane shell southward in Milton's track. Just in this moment when the morning odors rise abroad and first from the wild thyme, stands a fountain in a rock of crystal flowing into two streams. One flows through Golgonuza and through Beula to Eden beneath Los's western wall. The other flows through the aerial void and all the churches meeting again in Golgonuza beyond Satan's seat. The wild time is Los's messenger to Eden, a mighty demon terrible, deadly, and poisonous his presence in Al-Rodark. Therefore he appears only a small root creeping in grass, covering over the rock of odors his bright purple mantle, beside the fount above the lark's nest in Golgonuza. Luva slept here in death, and here is Luva's empty tomb. Ololon sat beside this fountain on the rock of odors. Just at the place to where the lark mounts is a crystal gate. It is the entrance of the first heaven named Luther, for the lark is Losa's messenger through the twenty-seven churches that the seven eyes of God, who walk even to Satan's seat through all the twenty-seven heavens, may not slumber nor sleep. But the lark's nest is at the gate of Los, at the eastern gate of white Golgonuza, and the lark is Losa's messenger. When on the highest lift of his slight pinions he arrives at that bright gate, another lark meets him, and back to back they touch their pinions tip-tip, and each descend to their respective earths, and there all night consult with angels of providence, and with the eyes of God all night in slumbers inspired, 
and at the dawn of day sent out another lark into another heaven to carry news upon his wings. Thus are the messengers dispatched till they reach the earth again in the east gate of Golgonusa, and the twenty-eighth bright lark met the female Ololon descending into my garden. Thus it appears to mortal eyes and those of the Alro heavens, but not thus to immortals the lark is a mighty angel. For Ololon stepped into the polypus within the mundane shell. They could not step into vegetable worlds without becoming the enemies of humanity except in a female form. And as one female Ololon and all its mighty hosts appeared, a virgin of twelve years nor time nor space was to the perception of the virgin Ololon, but as the flash of lightning, but more quick the virgin in my garden before my cottage stood, for the satanic space is delusion. For when laws joined with me, he took me in his fiery whirlwind. My vegetated portion was hurried from Lambeth's shade. He set me down in Felpham's vale and prepared a beautiful cottage for me, that in three years I might write all these visions, to display nature's cruel holiness, the deceits of natural religion. Walking in my cottage garden, sudden I beheld the virgin Ololon and addressed her as a daughter of Beula. Virgin of Providence, fear not to enter into my cottage. What is thy message to thy friend? What am I now to do? Is it again to plunge into deeper affliction? Behold me ready to obey, but pity thou my shadow of delight. Enter my cottage, comfort her, for she is sick with fatigue. The virgin answered, Now is thou of Milton who descended, driven from eternity, him I seek. Terrified at my act in great eternity, which thou knowest, I come him to seek. So Ololon uttered in words distinct the anxious thought, mild was the voice, but more distinct than any earthly, that Milton's shadow heard, and condensing all his fibres into a strength impregnable of majesty and beauty infinite, I saw he was the covering cherub, and within him Satan, and Rahab in an outside which is fallacious within beyond the outline of identity in the selfhood deadly and he appeared the wicker man of scandinavia in whom jerusalem's children consume in flames among the stars descending down into my garden a human wonder of god reaching from heaven to earth a cloud and human form i beheld milton with astonishment and in him beheld the monstrous churches of beula the gods of alro dark Twelve monstrous, dishumanized terrors, synagogues of Satan. A double twelve and thrice nine, such their divisions. And these their names and their places within the mundane shell. In Tyre and Sidon I saw Baal and Ashtaroth. In Moab, Chemosh. In Ammon, Molech. Loud his furnaces rage among the wheels of Og, and pealing loud the cries of the victims of fire and pale his priestesses enfolded in veils of pestilence, bordered with war, woven in looms of Tyre and Sidon by beautiful Ashtaroth. In Palestine, Dagon, sea monster, worshipped o'er the sea, Thamus in Lebanon, and Rimon in Damascus, curtained, Osiris, Isis, Horus in Egypt, dark their tabernacles on Nile, floating with solemn songs, and on the lakes of Egypt, nightly with pomp, even till morning break, and Osiris appear in the sky. But Belial of Sodom and Gomorrah, obscure demon of bribes and secret assassinations, not worshipped nor adored, but with the finger on the lips and the back turned to the light, and Saturn, Jove, and Rhea of the isles of the sea remote, these twelve gods are the twelve spectre sons of the druid Albion. And these the names of the twenty-seven heavens and their churches. Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech. These are giants, mighty hermaphroditic. Noah, Shem, Arhasat, Canaan the second, Salah, Heber, Pig, Reu, Seruk, Nahor, Terach. These are the female males, a male within a female hid, as in an ark and curtains. Abraham, Moses, Solomon, Paul, Constantine, Charlemagne, Luther, these seven are the male females, 
the dragon forms religion hid in war, a dragon red and hidden harlot. All these are seen in Milton's shadow, who is the covering cherub, the spectre of Albion in which the spectre of Luva inhabits, and the Newtonian voids between the substances of creation. For the chaotic voids outside the stars are measured by the stars, which are the boundaries of kingdoms, provinces and empires of chaos, invisible to the vegetable man. The kingdom of Og is in Orion, Sion is in Ophiuchus. Og has twenty-seven districts, Sion's districts twenty-one from star to star. Mountains and valleys, terrible dimensions stretched out, compose the mundane shell, a mighty incrustation of forty-eight deformed human wonders of the Almighty, with caverns whose remotest bottoms meet again beyond the mundane shell in Golgonusa, but the fires of laws rage in the remotest bottoms of the caves, that none can pass into eternity that way, but all descend to laws. To Baulahula and Alamanda, and to Antuthon Benithon. The heavens are the Cherub, the twelve gods are Satan, and the forty-eight starry regions are cities of the Levites, the heads of the great polypus, fourfold twelve enormity, in mighty and mysterious commingling enemy with enemy, woven by Urizen into sexes from his mantle of years, and Milton collecting all his fibres into impregnable strength, descended down a paved work of all kinds of precious stones, out from the eastern sky descending down into my cottage garden, clothed in black, severe and silent, he descended. The spectre of Satan stood upon the roaring sea and beheld Milton with an high sleeping humanity. Trembling and shuddering he stood upon the waves a twenty-sevenfold mighty demon, gorgeous and beautiful. Loud rolled his thunders against Milton. Loud Satan thundered. Loud and dark upon mild Felpham shore, not daring to touch one fibre, he howled round upon the sea. I also stood in Satan's bosom and beheld its desolations. A ruined man, a ruined building of God not made with hands. Its plains of burning sand, its mountains of marble terrible. Its pits and declivities flowing with molten ore and fountains of pitch and nitre. Its ruined palaces and cities and mighty works. Its furnaces of affliction in which his angels and emanations labor with blackened visages among its stupendous ruins arches and pyramids and porches, colonnades and domes, in which dwells mystery Babylon. Here is her secret place, from hence she comes forth on the churches in delight. Here is her cup filled with its poisons, in these horrid veils, and here her scarlet veil woven in pestilence and war. Here is Jerusalem bound in chains, in the dens of Babylon. In the eastern porch of Satan's universe, Milton stood and said, Satan, my spectre, I know my power thee to annihilate, and be a greater in thy place, and be thy tabernacle, a covering for thee to do thy will, till one greater cometh, and smites me as I smote thee, and becomes my covering. Such are the laws of thy false heavens, but laws of eternity are not such. Know thou, I come to self-annihilation. Such are the laws of eternity that each shall mutually annihilate himself for others' good, as I for thee. Thy purpose and the purpose of thy priests and of thy churches is to impress on men the fear of death, to teach trembling and fear, terror, constriction, abject selfishness. Mine is to teach men to despise death and to go on in fearless majesty annihilating self, laughing to scorn thy laws and terrors, shaking down thy synagogues as webs, I come to discover before heaven and hell the self-righteousness in all its hypocritic turpitude, opening to every eye these wonders of Satan's holiness, shewing to the earth the idle virtues of the natural heart and Satan's seat, exploring all its selfish natural virtue, and put off in self-annihilation all that is not of God alone, to put off self, and all I have ever and ever. Amen. Satan heard. Coming in a cloud with trumpets and flaming fire, saying, I am God, the judge of all, the living and the dead. 
Fall therefore down and worship me. Submit thy supreme dictate to my eternal will and to my dictate bow. I hold the balances of right and just, and mine the sword. Seven angels bear my name, and in those seven I appear, but I alone am God, and I alone in heaven and earth, of all that live dare utter this, others tremble and bow, till all things become one great Satan, in holiness opposed to mercy, and the divine delusion Jesus be no more. Suddenly around Milton on my path the starry seven burned terrible. My path became a solid fire, as bright as the clear sun and Milton's silent came down on my path. And there went forth from the starry limbs of the seven forms human with trumpets innumerable, sounding articulate as the seven spake, and they stood in a mighty column of fire, surrounding Felpham's veil, reaching to the mundane shell, saying, Awake, Albion, awake! Reclaim thy reasoning spectre! Subdue him to the divine mercy! Cast him down into the lake of laws that ever burneth with fire, ever and ever! Amen! Let the four Zoas awake from the slumbers of six thousand years. Then loud the furnaces of laws were heard, and seen as seven heavens stretching from south to north over the mountains of Albion. Satan heard. Trembling round his body, he encircled it, he trembled with exceeding great trembling and astonishment, howling in his spectre round his body hungering to devour, but fearing for the pain, for if he touches a vital, his torment is unendurable, therefore he cannot devour, but howls round it as a lion round his prey continually, loud Satan thundered, loud and dark, upon mild Felpham's shore. Coming in a cloud with trumpets and with fiery flame, an awful form eastward from midst of a bright paved work of precious stones, by cherubim surrounded, so permitted, lest he should fall apart in his eternal death, to imitate the eternal great humanity divine, surrounded by his cherubim and seraphim, in ever happy eternity, beneath said chaos, sin on his right hand, death on his left. And ancient night spread over all the heaven his mantle of laws. He trembled with exceeding great trembling and astonishment. Then Albion rose up in the night of Beula on his couch, of dread repose, seen by the visionary eye. His face is toward the east, toward Jerusalem's gates. Groaning he sat above his rocks. London and Bath and Legions and Edinburgh are the four pillars of his throne. His left foot near London covers the shades of Tyburn, his instep from Windsor to Primrose Hill stretching to Highgate and Holloway. London is between his knees, its basements fourfold. His right foot stretches to the sea on Dover cliffs, his heel on Canterbury's ruins. His right hand covers lofty Wales, his left Scotland. His bosom girt with gold involves York, Edinburgh, Durham, and Carlisle, and on the front, Bath, Oxford, Cambridge, Norwich. His right elbow leans on the rocks of Erin's land, Ireland, ancient nation. His head bends over London. He sees his embodied spectre trembling before him with exceeding great trembling and fear. He views Jerusalem and Babylon. His tears flow down. He moved his right foot to Cornwall, his left to the rocks of Bognor. He strove to rise, to walk into the deep, but strength failing forbade, and down with dreadful groans he sunk upon his couch in Moony Bula. Lost his strong guard walks round beneath the moon. Urizen faints in terror, striving among the brooks of Arnon with Milton's spirit, as the ploughman or artificer or shepherd, while in the labours of his calling sends his thought abroad, to labor in the ocean or in the starry heaven. So Milton labored in chasms of the mundane shell, though here before my cottage midst the starry seven, where the virgin Ololon stood trembling in the porch. Loud Satan thundered on the stormy sea, circling Albion's cliffs in which the fourfold world resides, though seen in fallacy outside, a fallacy of Satan's churches. Before Ololon Milton stood, and perceived the eternal form of that mild vision. Wondrous were their acts by me unknown, except remotely, and I heard Ololan say to Milton, I see thee strive upon the brooks of Arnon. There a dread and awful man I see, 
or covered with the mantle of years. I behold Los and Urizen, I behold Ork and Tharmas, the four Zoas of Albion, and thy spirit with them striving in self-annihilation, giving thy life to thy enemies, are those who contemn religion and seek to annihilate it. Become in their feminine portions the causes and promoters of these religions, how is this thing, this Newtonian phantasm, this Voltaire and Rousseau, this Hume and Gibbon and Bolingbroke, this natural religion, this impossible absurdity, is Ololon the cause of this? Oh, where shall I hide my face? These tears fall for the little ones, the children of Jerusalem, lest they be annihilated in thy annihilation. No sooner she had spoke, but Rahab Babylon appeared, eastward upon the paved work across Europe and Asia, glorious as the midday sun in Satan's bosom glowing, a female hidden in a male, religion hidden in war. Named moral virtue, cruel twofold monster, shining bright, a dragon red and hidden harlot, which John in Patmos saw. And all beneath the nations innumerable of Alro appeared the seven kingdoms of Canaan and five Balim of Philistia, into twelve divided, called after the names of Israel, as they are in Eden. Mountain, river and plain, city and sandy desert intermingled beyond mortal ken. But turning toward Ololon in terrible majesty, Milton replied, Obey thou the words of the inspired man. All that can be annihilated must be annihilated. That the children of Jerusalem may be saved from slavery, there is a negation and there is a contrary. The negation must be destroyed to redeem the contraries. The negation is the specter, the reasoning power in man. This is a false body an incrustation over my immortal spirit, a selfhood which must be put off and annihilated always, to cleanse the face of my spirit by self-examination. To bathe in the waters of life, to wash off the not human, I come in self-annihilation, and the grandeur of inspiration to cast off rational demonstration by faith in the Saviour, to cast off the rotten rags of memory by inspiration, to cast off Bacon, Locke and Newton from Albion's covering, to take off his filthy garments and clothe him with imagination, to cast aside from poetry all that is not inspiration, that it no longer shall dare to mock with the aspersion of madness cast in the inspired by the tame high finisher of paltry blots, indefinite or paltry rhymes or paltry harmonies, who creeps into state government like a caterpillar to destroy, to cast off the idiot questioner who is always questioning, but never capable of answering, who sits with a sly grin, silent plotting when to question like a thief in a cave, who publishes doubt and calls it knowledge, whose science is despair, whose pretense to knowledge is envy, whose whole science is to destroy the wisdom of ages to gratify ravenous envy, that rages round him like a wolf day and night without rest. He smiles with condescension, he talks of benevolence and virtue, and those who act with benevolence and virtue they murder time on time. These are the destroyers of Jerusalem. These are the murderers of Jesus, who deny the faith and mock at eternal life, who pretend to poetry that they may destroy imagination. By imitation of nature's images drawn from remembrance, these are the sexual garments, the abomination of desolation, hiding the human lineaments as with an ark and curtains which Jesus rent, and now shall wholly purge away with fire till generation is swallowed up in regeneration. Then trembled the virgin Ololon and replied in clouds of despair, Is this our feminine portion, the sixfold Miltonic female, terribly this portion trembles before thee, O awful man? Although our human power can sustain the severe contentions of friendship, our sexual cannot but flies into the Ulro. Hence arose all our terrors in eternity, and now remembrance returns upon us. Are we contraries, O Milton, thou and I, O immortal? How were we led to war the wars of death? Is this the void outside of existence, which if entered into becomes a womb? And is this the death couch of Albion? Thou goest to eternal death, and all must go with thee. So saying, the virgin divided sixfold, and with a shriek dolorous that ran through all creation a double sixfold wonder. 
away from Ololon she divided and fled into the depths of Milton's shadow as a dove upon the stormy sea. Then as a moony ark Ololon descended to Felpham's vale in clouds of blood, in streams of gore, with dreadful thunderings into the fires of intellect that rejoiced in Felpham's vale. Around the starry eight, with one accord, the starry eight became one man, Jesus the Saviour. Wonderful, round his limbs the clouds of Ololon folded as a garment dipped in blood, written within and without in woven letters, and the writing is the divine revelation in the literal expression. A garment of war I heard it named the woof of six thousand years. And I beheld the twenty-four cities of Albion arise upon their thrones to judge the nations of the earth, and the immortal four in whom the twenty-four appear fourfold arose around Albion's body. Jesus wept and walked forth from Felpham's veil, clothed in clouds of blood to enter into Albion's bosom, the bosom of death, and the four surrounded him in the column of fire in Felpham's veil. Then to their mouths the four applied their four trumpets, and them sounded to the four winds. Terror struck in the veil. I stood at that immortal sound, my bones trembled. I fell outstretched upon the path. A moment and my soul returned into its mortal state, to resurrection and judgment in the vegetable body, and my sweet shadow of delight stood trembling by my side. Immediately the lark mounted with a loud trill from Felpham's vale and the wild thyme from Wimbledon's green and empurpled hills, and Laws and Enitharmon rose over the hills of Surrey, the clouds roll over London with a south wind. Soft o Othorn pants in the vales of Lambeth, weeping o'er her human harvest. Laws listens to the cry of the poor man, his cloud over London in volume terrific, low bended in anger. Rintra and Palamabron view the human harvest beneath, their wine presses and barns stand open, the ovens are prepared, the wagons ready. Terrific lions and tigers sport and play. All animals upon the earth are prepared in all their strength to go forth to the great harvest and vintage of the nations. Phoenix. End of section 6 of Milton, a poem by William Blake. End of Milton, a poem by William Blake.